On June 9th, 2012, I posted the first episode of my Super Flat Survival series. I kept working on the world year after year until almost 10 years later in May of 2022, I was finally able to quit my job and do YouTube full time. Now, as my world turns 11 years old, we can look back on everything we've accomplished in the past year. And I think it's safe to say this was the craziest year ever for the flat world. I took on the most ambitious projects I've ever done. So without further ado, please enjoy my past year in Survival Superflat. My Superflat Survival World just turned 10 years old and I still don't have any end base. We've all seen those insane bases that people build in the end dimension and I want to make one too, but in order to do that, I need to get rid of the main island, which takes forever. So I've been formulating a plan to erase the whole island in a matter of minutes. And the plan has to do with Swiss cheese. Huh? No, I'm not crazy. Why would you say that? I'll show all of you. But before before we can start destroying the island, we'll want to get all 20 of these end gateways. So far I've killed the dragon twice in this world, so we're gonna need to do it 18 more times. Resummoning the end dragon requires four end crystals, meaning we'll need 72 in total. Each crystal takes one gas tier, but luckily we recently built this little gas farm. I have plenty of glass and ender eyes, so we should be good to go. Perfect, okay, that's one thing down. Next, we're gonna wanna get geared up. I'm bringing tons of arrows from my piglin bartering farm, and we can also bring along some boats to trap any endermen that get angry with us. But just to be extra safe, I'd love to have some totems of of undying ready to go in case things go wrong. The only problem is we still don't have a raid farm. I've been putting that off literally forever. So it's time to finally put one together. We're using ENX-04's design, which I've heard is pretty easy to construct. I picked out the spot behind the spurge since there's plenty of villagers to grab from over here. It's a couple hours later now and I finally got the raid farm fully functioning. And this thing is like incredible, dude. I AFK'd at it for like five minutes and my chests are full of stuff. I'm never gonna have to trade for emeralds or redstone ever again. And best of all, we already have a full shulker box of Totems of Undying for this dragon fight. The view flying back from this thing is actually really cool. Oh, I love our base. We've got our arrows, boats, totems, and end crystals, so I think I'm ready to do this. Oh, and shout out to Knight in my Discord for these cute little Mog Swamp themed totems. It's me. Here we go. Oh God, I'm nervous for some reason. All right, round one. Round one done. Just gotta do this 17 more times. Wait, what? Did that hit it on the way back down? Nice. Oh God. No, no, no. Somehow I still died. I really am terrible at this game. Man, I really wanted to do this without dying. Big respect to hardcore players. I do not know how you guys do it. crystals, but you'll notice I am missing one of the end gateways, and that's because apparently if you quit the game right as you're spawning the dragon, it just never spawns. Bruh. So let's go back and make the last four crystals. Ow. And here we go. I've done this so many times now, I'm pretty confident. So if I die during this last fight, I'll delete my flat world forever. <laughs> Easy. My flat world is safe and sound. And there we go. All 20 end gateways are now in place. With that all done, it's time to reveal my secret plan, Operation Swiss Cheese. The plan is simple. I'm starting by laying out a grid of holes with two blocks between each one. I'm beginning below the end portal and just making holes until I reach the very edges of the island. Each of these holes will be dug all the way through the island to the bottom, which is gonna take a while. If you haven't figured it out already, this is why we're calling this Operation Swiss Cheese. Before we start the drilling, I have to place a platform below the island to catch me when I dig down. It's also gonna help me plug the holes from below when I drill them. We need to plug the holes because each one is gonna be filled up with TNT. This is gonna take a ton of TNT, maybe even 100,000 blocks. For my testing in creative mode, I think this should clear out the three by three area of end stone around each block of TNT. The goal is that once I light one TNT, the entire end island will be gone within minutes. And hopefully my PC doesn't just crash. I set up a few chests to collect all the end stone I would get, and after that, I was pretty much ready to go. It was time to start drilling, and drilling, and drilling, and drilling. Man, I'm, I'm getting really good at drilling. 
This is giving me ideas. I'm drilling the end. The mobs can't contend. Already killed the dragon 20 times. She's not my friend. Not afraid to look straight in the eyes of the endermen. All these YouTubers just hop on the back of the latest trends. These mobs are ops. Got my bucket of water in my chest but forgot my mop. My name's Mark Swap. Pull up on a skeleton horse cock cock. And it's time to shop. So I ring the wandering trailer. He can't comprehend the amount of emeralds that I spend. Okay, no, 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 no. Bad idea. Terrible idea. I'm gonna stick to drilling in the game only. But rap career aside, I still have a lot of work to do. I've been drilling holes for about a week now, and um, I'm beginning to lose my mind. I've been capping off the holes with the nether axe so I can easily see which ones I've already done, and after days of digging, I'm still not even done. The worst part is, drilling the holes is only the halfway point. I'm still gonna have to fill everything up with TNT, which takes just as long. Honestly, I don't know how I'm ever gonna get this video out to you guys. Two days later. <sighs> I've been grinding non-stop, and it made me start to wonder how long it would take to mine the whole end. I found a video by Pippin FTS, and it took him 145 hours to mine everything, but he did it by hand. But I couldn't find anyone else who used TNT, but didn't use a TNT duping flying machine. See, I have a rule against TNT duping in my world, partly because I feel bad for having to dupe the sand for the TNT, since the Wandering Trader only sells sand very rarely, and only one stack at a time. Plus, not duping the TNT gives me a use for all the gunpowder we get from our mob hotel, and it forces me to build farms that really take advantage of every blast and are completely future-proof just in case Mojang finally decides to remove TNT duping from the game. But I think my friend Beppo used TNT duping to clear his island, right? Yeah. Jesus, I didn't realize you were listening. Okay, how long did that take, Beppo? Uh, I think about 30 hours in all. Okay, so in theory we'll land somewhere in between 30 and 145 hours. I haven't been timing it super closely, but I'm guessing I've done at least 50 hours so far if you count repairing my pick and elytra and gathering netherrack and placing the scaffolding below the island but we still need to place the TNT. Based on how much end stone we got, it's looking like we'll probably need something like 100,000 TNT. I think that's around 60 shulker boxes. So far, I have about 44 boxes collected. You know, the further I get into this project, the more I feel like this is definitely going to crash my PC. What was I thinking? <laughs> But despite my fears, I pressed on and began placing the TNT for hours on end. And as I did so, I began to reflect on my origins on YouTube. You see, Mog Swamp is not my first YouTube channel. I actually got my start making YouTube videos way back in February 2007. I mostly did pivot animations, and I would set up dominoes and do these huge domino rallies. And the more I thought about this, the more it all just started to make sense. Setting up dominoes for hours and hours, only to knock them down and have it over in seconds. Or drawing for countless hours, just to get a few seconds of animation. I mean, this really is no different. Grinding for weeks on end to create one massive explosion that will be over in just a few minutes? I guess I'm still that same kid I was 15 years ago. I've just always been willing to grind for those few seconds of blissful payoff. Maybe that's why I was able to keep my YouTube channel and this world going for over 10 years. When I read that one comment that just really touches me and makes my day, it makes it all worth it. Three days later. It's been another few days and I'm almost done with this. Out of the whole island, all I have left is this little corner here. But I do think I've begun to lose my mind. I've been staring at this texture for so long, I'm beginning to see things. Like from this direction, it looks like a Raichu doing a tail whip. From this direction, I see like a fox or a wolf on a leash. Then we have the man dancing with a jump rope or like a tassel. And this side just looks kind of sus. Oh my god, it's done. It's actually done. Oh, this took so long. This is so surreal. Literally three weeks of just digging holes and placing TNT, and finally the explosion is ready to go. I went ahead and cleaned up all the end stone we had mined, and just look at how many chests it fills up. It's insane. I was gonna clean up the nether rack under the island as well, but I figured we might as well just set off the explosion and see how much of it gets blown up. That might save me a bunch of work. Let's take a look at my statistics real quick. Over the course of this project, I went from 1,338 end stone mined to 134,578 and I went from 11,250 TNT placed 
to 146,804. This has been insane, and now we're ready to explode the end once and for all. As I stand here, I'm reminded of all the past explosions I've done in Minecraft. Messing around with too many items when I first got the game, exploding my base on the Red Cube server back in December 2013, that was 4,000 TNT, or exploding the giant creeper a few months ago, that was 5,000 TNT. But this is 135,000 TNT. Based on my calculations, that's equivalent to about 224 kilotons. For reference, the two nuclear bombs that the US dropped on Japan in World War II were only equivalent to 40 kilotons combined. We are quite literally nuking the end and possibly my computer as well. I have no idea how this is gonna go, so there's only one way to find out. Let's do this. I guess this is it. Here we go. Oh my god, oh my god, it's happening. Is it going? Oh god. Okay, now it's going, it's going now! Oh god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Oh jeez! No, my light just freaking out. Oh, wow. This is insane. Somehow my computer's not crashing from this. Dude, oh my god, I'm speechless right now. <laughs> what is happening? Oh no, we forgot to close up the portal. Oh my god, we gotta go fast. Go, go, go. Oh my god, no. I can't, I can't stop flying. I can't eat. I could be dead, I don't even know. Go, go, go. Oh, thank god. No, <laughs> give it back. <laughs> no. <laughs> the TNT is coming. I can't eat food. Okay, I just have to run. Oh my god, look at it go. It's spreading across the whole island. <laughs> look at the Enderman. It's like a stop motion animation of the island just slowly disappearing. I'm glad I didn't try to clean up the netherrack down there because it looks like the TNT is doing it for me. Dude, this looks so cool. Look at it slowly disappear. Oh my God, it's all gone. <laughs> the poor Enderman, dude. <laughs> oh yes, dude. Yes, we did it. I can't believe it. My end island is gone. Look at all the Endermen just taking refuge on this one little... <laughs> yeah, it would have been a huge waste of time to get rid of the netherrack by hand. I'm glad I didn't do that. Dude, this is just unbelievable. I guess we have a little cleanup to do, but this island's gone! It's gone! I wonder what happened over here. Oh no! Oh no! Wow. This is just the most insane thing I've ever done. I can't believe this. Wow. I'm never gonna forget this moment. I can't believe my computer didn't just crash. And I'm, I'm glad we went for the amount of TNT we did because I wouldn't want more of this little debris to clear out. Well, I've got some cleanup to do, so I guess that's it. Weeks of hard work and it was all over in seven minutes. But you know what? I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. Thanks for watching. Underneath the bedrock layer in every Minecraft world is a mysterious region called the Void, where the player constantly takes damage and no blocks can be placed. But what if I told you that super flat worlds are actually different? Today I'm gonna prove it by building an entire ocean biome with sea monsters and sunken ships all underneath bedrock. This might be my favorite project I've ever done, so make sure to watch to the end. So way back in November 2021, Minecraft 1.18 was released, which lowered the build height by 64 blocks. But unlike in normal 
normal worlds, the bedrock layer in Superflat was not replaced with Deep Slate, since Mojang didn't want to mess with everyone's creative nope. worlds. This was kind of a bummer, because I was hoping I would be able to build a bit lower in my harbor area here to allow room for big ships. But this also provided a unique opportunity. See, if I were to break the bedrock, I'd still be able to build underneath. So back in January, I decided to drain my harbor area completely and start removing bedrock, allowing me access to building below Y0. And luckily, I had found a special technique that was perfect for the job. This method requires tweakaroo to enable fast right clicking and the ability to place pistons face down. It might be a little non-vanilla, but it was the only way that breaking this much bedrock could be feasible for one man, so I decided to get to work. And from January to May, you could slowly see the bedrock disappear in the background of each of my videos. And after months of grinding, whenever I had some extra time, I finally finished in late May. About 13,000 blocks of bedrock removed entirely by hand. Of course, I could have used a bedrock breaking machine, but the shape of this area is so strange it would been really hard to pull off. But now after months of work, I get to do the fun part. It's time to start designing the shape of our lake bed. I'm thinking this part will be really shallow and over here it will get deeper with a big underwater ravine reaching down in the middle. Since most of the lake bed is gonna be sand, we need to put dirt underneath to hold it up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is start wireframing. Okay, so I've got the shallow part of the bay totally mapped out and I've started shaping the ravine area as well. I quickly finished up all the wireframing, but at that point I was feeling pretty burnt out. So I took a break to celebrate 10 years in my flat world, blow up my entire end island, and go on vacation. But more importantly, during this time, I met a group of builders called The Bakery. See, I really wanted to top my giant underwater base, Salacia, and suddenly I was in touch with Instagram's most talented build team. They helped me learn world edit, which made it so much faster to design something crazy. The block palette is super complex, so I downloaded a mod called Lightmatica that overlays a schematic into your world so you can tell where each block goes. But in order to pull off my vision, we're gonna need a ton of random resources. Like yesterday, I spent all day in the nether collecting shroom lights. Another resource we're gonna need is a ton of copper. Right now, I use literally the most scuffed drown farm in the entire world, so we gotta fix this. Luckily, our favorite farm guy, enx 4 just came out with a new design. I already gathered up all the materials we need, so let's build this thing. Okay, this farm is actually insane. It works so well, it's actually lagging my game. I had to build it on one of these outer end islands because my main island is gone. I'm gonna leave this copper out to oxidize and we can start gathering some other materials. Another material I'm gonna need a lot of is clay. Luckily, you can now make clay by placing mud above dripstone. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make a hole in this wall here and make a quick way to convert dirt into mud using this TNT blast chamber. Big thanks to my friend Redstone CPU for helping me figure out the wiring for this. Now I can mine cobblestone, four different types of trees and convert dirt into mud blocks all at the same farm. With that done, I started converting all the mud into tons of stacks of clay. It's so nice to finally have a way to get lots of clay blocks. I've been collecting resources for so long and I feel like at this point, I just gotta get started. I guess I'm just gonna go down there and start placing blocks. I really went crazy with the palette on this build. I used tons of cyan wool, cyan concrete, and warped wood, which I'm hoping will give the water that like tropical teal color, like a Baja Blast. The sand and sandstone provide really good contrast. And in the ravine area, I transitioned to darker colors with blocks like blackstone, smooth basalt, and acacia. Also, thanks to Lightmatica, I was able to save a ton of blocks by leaving holes where the coral will eventually be placed. And I went ahead and finished off the shallow part of the bay. This is looking absolutely crazy so far. Some of the block choices feel so strange, but they just kind of work, you know? But we're far from finished. I've got a checklist of things I still want to get done. An underwater cave, a sunken ship, tons of coral, and an entire sea monster. I'm about to start streaming, so I'm going to build this cave right now. Let's see how it comes out. There we go. This was a super fun build to do on stream. I'm really stoked about how the red octopus came out, and I'm especially proud of how I did the eyes on this one. This is gonna look so cool once it's filled up with water. Next up, we're gonna work on the sunken ship. First, I built a basic ship, and then my friend Rebella showed me how to rotate it with world edit, and we added in all the final details. I've already collected all the resources I'm gonna need for this, except for rooted dirt. I just had to grow a ton of azalea trees and mine out the dirt underneath. I don't know if there's a farm for this, but we might have to make one in the future.
that right there is a sunken ship. This looks so cool. There's like trapdoors, glass panes, candles, sea pickles, all just kind of representing barnacles and coral growing on the side of this thing. I'm so excited because I think that once this thing is actually underwater, it's gonna look insane. Oh, and by the way, composters, pretty, pretty good building block. So the next thing to do is all the coral. So I began searching. Images of coral, coral concept art, screen caps from Disney Pixar's critically acclaimed 2003 animated film Finding Nemo, bushy coral, shelfy coral, tubey coral. I wanted to build it all. So first I laid out some block palettes to use. I got to work trading for all of the terracotta I would need and then I fetched all the wool colors needed from our sheer towers. After some AFKing at the sand duper and some piglin bartering for gravel, I had all the concrete needed as well. With all the resources ready to go, I started placing all the coral and thanks to Lightmatica, it actually went pretty fast. The coral really brings this area to life and hopefully the big seaweed I built will go nicely with the kelp and seagrass we'll be placing once the water's all in. It's obvious from my to-do list that the next thing I should do is complete the sea monster so we can fill this bay up with water. So instead, I'm procrastinating and working on finishing up the shores. I didn't include these parts in the Lightmatica schematic because I figured it'd be faster to freehand it. But now that the shores are done, I really can't procrastinate anymore. Really, it's not so bad. I just need to AFK for a bit at the new copper farm. Six and a half hours later. And now I just need to AFK a bit for the copper to oxidize. Two hours later. And now after way too much AFKing, it's finally time to build this thing. Designing this thing was super cool. First, I built a spine in the air with the up command. Then I used the spike tool in Archeon to create that serpent shape. After that, it was just a matter of adding fins and other details. I used Purper just to try to prove to the haters that Purper can actually look good. The build itself wasn't even that many blocks. I actually had plenty of copper to spare. His face is so goofy, but it's also kind of creepy at the same time. I'm really happy with how it came out. I cannot stop flying around here. This is looking so insane. Honestly, it's kind of a shame I have to fill it up with water now and you're not gonna be able to see it as well, but it's gonna be so sick to go diving down there, so it's worth it. And now I'm just gonna do my best to add a couple small fish here and there. Clownfish. Okay, use your imagination a little. Blue fish. Huh? <laughs> These ones look so bad. And two of the really cool guy from Finding Nemo. I actually really like how these two came out. So I guess all that's left to do now is fill this thing up with water. And once the water's in place, we can spam kelp and sea pickles and seagrass everywhere. It should look really cool. So a couple of water buckets should be all I need. Let's do this. This is not my first time filling up a ton of water. Filling up Salacia taught me a lot about filling large spaces with water. And honestly, I think Salacia took a lot longer. So this felt like a piece of cake. The trick is just to go layer by layer and help the source blocks spread across. I'm gonna start to decorate the bottom before the water gets too high. That way I won't really need water breathing potions. I've just been spamming kelp, bone meal, and sea pickles and it looks so much better. Ah, oh, this is so bittersweet. I mean, it looks so cool with the water, but it also looks so cool without the water. I don't know, I'm conflicted, but I'm just gonna keep carrying on. This looks so weird. I almost have the entire bottom area filled up, but right now it kind of just looks like there's a really bad drought. There's only a few layers left to go on this thing and it's looking insane. It adds like so much depth and dimension to this world. The coral, the kelp, this whole underwater ravine area, it all just looks amazing. Oh my God. I'm gonna finish up the last few levels so we can really check this thing out. I think I just have two more layers of water left now, which is crazy. And I think this is the very last layer here. Man, this is gonna look crazy. It's so weird to actually see these ships in water. They've just been floating for so long. What can I say? This project has been months in the making and sure that was mostly because of procrastination. But hey, procrastination is still a part of the struggle. You gotta trust the process. I added a bunch more kelp, seagrass, sea pickles, and I also added a bunch of smaller lily pads. I'll put in some tropical fish later. For now, I just added some cod from the fisherman villager. And to finish this off once and for all, I added some actual coral blocks around near the larger coral cluster. I can't believe the bay is finally done. I'm so excited to build big ships and more buildings, and I still can't believe all of this is under bedrock. I never dreamed I'd be able to build down here. But with Minecraft, you just never know. Nothing's impossible. Thanks for watching. In this 
video, I attempt to build the craziest end base that's ever been made in survival Minecraft, and I think it's easily the biggest project I've ever done. Make sure to watch to the end of the video and let me know if I actually pulled it off. The very first step to any jaw-dropping end base is to clear out the existing end island. So I spent two weeks drilling holes and filling them with TNT. It took 135,000 TNT, but it was totally worth it. The explosion destroyed the entire end island in only seven minutes. It was like watching a chemical reaction. But now I'm left with a totally blank canvas. I started making a list of things I want to do with my end base. Number one is try my hand at terraforming. Now that I've begun to learn world edit, I really think I can level up. Second, I want to make something sort of cyberpunky. My overworld base is sort of medieval with nothing really fancier than like steam power. It would be cool to try to work in a more futuristic style. And lastly, I want to make sure that I include lots of color. The end is such a dark place and some bright colors will really help the base stand out. So I started drawing and after a few different iterations, I had a solid plan. Our end pillars are going to be buried in a big lush island full of greenery and custom trees. Scattered across the island, we'll have some simple pagoda style buildings and towering above will be a massive cyberpunk city. But just the terraforming alone is going to take forever. So we better start gathering resources. We're going to need a bunch of stuff. I started off by AFKing overnight at my cobble farm. We're going to use lots of cobble itself, but we're also going to need it for stuff like stone and andesite. After a full night of AFKing, I had chests and chests full. So I smelted up a bunch of it in my super smelter. Then it was time to craft a bunch of andesite. For this, we need quartz. And since I'm too lazy to mine for it, I AFKed overnight at my piglin farm. And then I did that again, two nights in a row. And that is why my levels are so freaking high. I got all the quartz I needed and crafted up tons of andesite. Another thing we get from piglin bartering is gravel. Not only do we need gravel itself, but that's also gonna help us make a bunch of concrete powder. You also need sand for concrete powder. I use a sand duplication machine I built at my end portal with sand I bought from the wandering trader. I should probably mention I play on a 10 year old super flat world. Huh? I would go into it more, but I made a whole movie about it. And plus I need to stay focused. We have an entire island to build. The stones of the island are gonna use gray concrete, light gray concrete, and light gray concrete powder. And we're also gonna use green concrete powder for the grass. Our palette for the grass also includes moss blocks and green wool. Just a few hours of AFKing at the moss factory gave us plenty of moss. Then I visited my high capacity sheep farm and dyed all the sheep green. After yet another overnight AFK session, we had chests and chests full. We're gonna use light gray and gray wool for this project as well, but we have plenty of that at our sheep towers. We also need tons of smooth basalt, but luckily I have a basalt farm. I threw that into the super smelter as well, and then we had plenty of smooth basalt for the project. All the resources we've collected so far have been a breeze, but now it's time to move on to some harder ones. Our tree farm only handles oak, birch, jungle, and spruce saplings. That means all the acacia and mangrove wood we're gonna need for this project has to be mined by hand. Eventually, we'll make farms for those wood types as well, but today I'm not feeling it. I only had one villager selling cyan terracotta, so I traded with tons of masons until I got three more with the trade. Luckily, while unlocking the masons, I got a bunch of dripstone. After curing them all and trading with all four for a while, I had a good amount of cyan terracotta. Mud requires me to mine dirt by hand at the bottom of my world, but luckily I recently built this mud converter that hooks right into my blast chamber. With all these materials in shulker boxes and ready to go, it was finally time to start building the island. Oh, we're gonna need to light this up. <laughs> the progress is going pretty fast because I'm using light Matica to see where blocks need to go. The whole island was designed in creative mode with the help of my friend Junipi from the Bakery Builders. What's up, Juno? Hey. So how are we gonna lay in the basic shape of the island? For that, I usually go with the boulder command. The boulder command has this cool modifier that lets you choose the smoothness of the boulder from zero to five. I usually use two to three. How do we like smooth it out? We can use something called blend ball. With the main island shape down, it was time to add some big boulders to the landscape, like in my drawing. And once we had all the boulders in, we just needed to figure out where the grass layer would go. Once that grass layer was in place, we started painting and Juno showed me how to use a pearl and noise pattern to create smooth gradients. It adds an instant pattern, kind of like marbling. We used a combination of those Perlin gradients and the gradient brush from Go Paint to finish off the rest of the texturing on the island. Thanks for the help, Juno. Yeah, anytime, dude. With Juno's help, the island was looking just like I imagined it, and filling in the schematic was no problem at all thanks to all the resource collecting we did. And so it was time for one of my favorite things in Minecraft. I put on some good YouTube videos, zoned out, and got building. And before I knew it, the island came to life before my eyes. At this point, I've basically finished placing all the grass for this island, but there's still so much stone that needs to be placed under here. We're making so much good progress. I finished up all the mud that surrounds the grass, and you can see I put like the base of all these boulders in just so I know where they start. So really now we just need to finish up these boulders and eventually finish up this lake area. 
by hiding shroom lights underneath moss carpets, I was able to make sure this island is nice and bright, which looks nice and is also important in case we ever want to try and mob proof it fully. All right, guys, I finally finished up all these boulders. And I have to say, this entire island is looking insane. I know I've already seen it so many times in creative mode, but somehow it just hits different when you actually build it in survival. I've still got to finish up this little lake bed area, but I think I'm going to save that for the end of the video. That means the last thing we need to do before starting our big structure is put in some beautiful cherry blossom trees. I'm going to be building all of these completely from scratch by hand, so this should be fun. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that tree building isn't so hard. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. I just really think some people need to branch out. You can't be too comfortable in your roots. You just gotta stick to it. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll stop. And we're done. One dozen custom trees, except they look a little dead. So now's the really fun part. We need 17 stacks of pink glass, 13 stacks of pink wool, 10 stacks of pink concrete, seven stacks of magenta, and three of the pink glaze. And last but not least, we need 10 stacks of mushroom stems. So it's time to use our trusty mushroom stem farm. And there we are, 10 stacks of mushroom stems stems. All right, time to get to work. After losing all my levels, I moved on to creating the Shattered Islands that form the base of our mega structure. At this time, I was still finishing the design up with the help of Shovel241 and Snarple from the Bakery Builders. I was racing to try and finish the design as quickly as possible, but my PC was having major issues. This video was already taking me forever, and without a working computer, I didn't know what to do. But then I got in contact with Ironside Computers. Oh my god, they already finished it. I'm here. This is so exciting. I unboxed the PC and it immediately ran like a dream. I'm running all my favorite games with the highest graphics and editing is faster than ever before. Plus, Ironside even helped me install an extra drive and they've reached out from time to time to make sure that everything's running okay. Right now, they're doing a limited edition Tokyo Dream PC, which is such good inspiration for our cyberpunk build. This isn't just some faceless business. These guys are super knowledgeable and insanely down to earth and their builds are stylish inside and out. If you don't believe me, just look at their YouTube channel. The builds are insane and they have interviews with the staff. Please help out the channel by checking out my affiliate link in the description below. I can't recommend them enough. Well, my PC troubles are finally over. I just got over COVID and I'm finally ready to get back to work. I mined up a shulker box of warped and crimson wood so we can start our first building. I used a double layer of glass and glass panes to get a sort of glow effect. To the right of the building is a staircase leading to an alleyway with this creeper graffiti. In the back of the alleyway, I built a condemned arcade using armor stands pushed into blocks for the arcade cabinets. I made some vending machines to really capture that cyberpunk vibe. Then I built a little ramen shop on the other side of the street. I began adding some detail to the front of the build and did this little green building with iron trapdoor windows. I had to use levers on the back to make some of them horizontal. It's a neat effect. This fan was a pain with all the observers behind it, and I had to spend a netherite on the lodestone in the middle. I think it was worth it. I've been working all day and you still can't even see the build from the spawning pad. Eventually when this thing is done, it's gonna go so high up. Every time I needed something during this build, I kept grabbing shulker boxes until this monstrosity formed. But on the bright side, now that everything's here, I'm starting to build a lot faster. Now I'm gonna try to build something really challenging. On these big flat spaces around the city, there's advertisements and murals that use a ton of random blocks. So. So let's just see how long this takes. I found a cool pixel art on Google and then made some edits to it and converted it to Minecraft blocks using an online tool. I just had to take out super flat unobtainables, but it wasn't too bad. Next, I built this lucky cat that I made with Snarple, who taught me how to make signs look neon by using gradients behind end rods. You can see what I mean from the back. The murals didn't take that long, so I started working on the crumbling bridge on the right side of the structure from my drawing. Shovel241 helped me create the dissolving effect at the end, and it came out really cool. It's hard to believe this used to be a normal end island, as I'm walking along this bridge. I can't wait to add more detail and make it more immersive. Next up, I built a shady tunnel with some sort of campsite. This is where the villagers probably go to do illegal trades. It's right above that other little alley area we built up. Somehow we're gonna need to transition the roof of this alley into the rest of the build. But at this point, I went back to filling in the gaps in the front of the structure, which really helps everything just feel more complete. 
I feel like we've already achieved my three main goals for this build, but there's so much more to go. I'm really happy with this build so far, but I think I need a break from these complex buildings. I want to put a ring of end rods connecting each of these end gateways surrounding our base. The first step is to lay down a dirt ring under where the end rods are going to go just to make placing them a little bit easier. Okay, I went ahead and got that dirt in place, so now it's time to start placing rods. These are the only end rods I have, so we're going to have to craft more, but let's just see how far this gets us. That didn't last very long. End rods are crafted with blaze rods and popped chorus fruit. Okay, I don't have a ton of blaze rods. Basically, I reset my nether in 1.16 when the nether updated, and so I don't have a blaze farm anymore. You might have to reset the nether, Nolan. I think you might be right. But at least we have a chorus fruit farm, so I'm gonna AFK here for a little bit. Okay, this thing is really slow, so I'm gonna get the chorus fruit manually. But to get to the end, we gotta go through the nether, so we might as well try to hunt for blazes while we're here. Hunting for blazes is way too slow, so I'm just gonna build a blaze farm. This, this won't take long, right? And it actually didn't take long. I built up the farm within a few minutes, and after like 10-15 minutes of AFKing, I had plenty of blaze rods. Now I just need to find some chorus fruit. There we go. This should be enough to finally finish our ring of end rods. And hopefully we'll have plenty left over for the rest of our city. Putting down the end rods and removing the dirt actually doesn't take that long. I was kind of dreading doing this ring, but it didn't take nearly as long as I thought, and it just looks so cool. But now, it's time to start the main tower that's really going to make this build feel like a city. Hopefully my resources will take me decently far. Man, these repeaters will look super cool when the build is finished, but they're so annoying to craft. It sounded so great when Snarple told me about it. <laughs> this building also used a lot of mud, so I went back to the overworld to gather more. And then I was struck by hubris. Like Icarus, I have flown too close to the sun. I knew this farm wasn't working for wood. The blast chamber's been a little screwed up lately. I thought the mud farm was fine though, and usually I'd make a backup, but I didn't want to break my replay mod time lapse, and it all exploded. I guess this farm is officially out of order until I can repair it. This was my only source for automatic mud, oak, birch, spruce, and jungle farming. Oof. Instead of thinking about all the wood I'm gonna need to manually farm soon, I went back to work on the tower and finished off this colorful little segment. Next, I made an entrance for a Chinese restaurant. I wanna do interiors for this base someday and I have so many fun ideas. I kept jumping around working on things for a while and then I did this rooftop garden area which came out really neat. And finally I built up this quarter circle building which helps break up the shape of the tower a little bit. This is kind of the main focal point of the build. Oh, we're finally starting to see the build from where we spawn in. It's looking so cool. I just came back from crafting target blocks. I'm using them up here to go behind some banners. Since banners disappear when you fly far away, the blocks behind kind of make up for that missing detail until you get close enough. This is a trick Snarple taught me. It mimics how in lots of games, detail loads in as you get closer. I gotta restock on wood, so I'm not gonna stop until all of these shulker boxes are full. I collected oak, birch, jungle, spruce, dark oak, and acacia. Hopefully I don't run out again, because this took a few hours. So far, this city has had a huge variety of blocks, but one of the things that Snarple taught me was to unify the style you use at the top of the builds. That way, it just kind of ties everything together in a cohesive way. So I think we can get a lot done by just finishing off the top of some of these towers. So I'm gonna try to do a little bit of that here. We're gonna go with like a pagoda style that's really gonna capture the cyberpunk feeling. Wish me luck. And there we go. A couple of the tops are now done. As expected, it didn't take that long because there's not a huge material list. The biggest issue is I keep running out of blackstone, but now this area is kind of like half finished and floating. It looks pretty bad. So I'm gonna continue work on this bridge area. And we also need to build the train car that's gonna go down here. The train car uses a bunch of weird redstone items. So I'm gonna craft them all up and let's get started.
You know, I have to be honest with you guys. There were times when I thought I might have to scrap this entire video. I mean, way back on September 29th, I made an emo tweet about not being able to get anything done on this video. And right now when I'm recording this, it's November 21st. So it's been almost two months. I went on vacation. I got sick. I went through PC troubles. But for the first time in this whole project, it's starting to feel like the end is in sight. Well, I guess technically the end has been in sight the whole video. But really the point is, sometimes in life you have to buckle down and get to work. Even when you doubt yourself, or when a project seems destined to fail. And Minecraft is no different. I pushed and pushed and now we're almost there. So it's time to give it that final push and finish this base. I tried to make signs for people that helped along the way. There's one for Shovel241 who helped a ton, especially with the bridge area. I also built one for Snarpo who taught me so much about building in the style that their sign even includes ancient debris. And there's one for Junipi who taught me so much about terraforming and helped me get this island looking just like how I imagined it. And I want to shout out Rebella, Snippet, Dobdi, and Airtug for helping out. It's an honor to be friends with such amazing builders. I also built this Ironside logo to shout out Ironside Computers for helping me with the new PC. And even though they aren't a sponsor, I made a sign for Sugar Free Red Bull because I drank a lot of them to finish this video. Please sponsor me. I wrapped up the main tower by putting another pagoda on top. I designed these two quartz lion statues that I think actually came out pretty good for the small scale. This pagoda is extra tall and dramatic to give this skyline some more verticality. This thing is enormous. Like, it's so tall, it takes me at least three rockets to get to the very top from our island. And once you get up here, out, the view really shows how high up you are. Really, the only major part of the city to fill in is this cluster on top of the bridge section. This had tons of tedious blocks to get, including tons of terracottas, wools, and concretes. Getting a villager for each terracotta color was such a long and tedious project, but it was so worth it for me to be able to do mega projects like this. But even though resource gathering wasn't too bad, a big challenge with this project was inventory management, which is why you see me flying around so much. I frequently have to repair my elytra at the end farm, but at least there's a cool view on the way back. Honestly, the hardest material in the whole build was wood, especially with all the trapdoors. But luckily I spent an entire stream refilling my shulker boxes, so I have more than enough. I finished up with this little cafe on top of one of the buildings. Eventually I really want to make the city totally explorable with interiors and easter eggs. I think I'll do a lot of that on stream in the future. I gotta comb through and fix some things here and there, but for the most part the exterior is pretty much finished. But there's still a few big holes in the city, and they all have one thing in common. They all require copper. It's time to use our copper farm just through this gateway way here I think. Oh yeah, this is it. I tried leaving the copper to oxidize in what I thought were my spawn chunks, but I'm not even sure these are my spawn chunks, and I don't know if it would work while I'm in the end or not, so I guess we're just gonna have to AFK overnight. Oh, looks like it's all done. After a bit more copper farming, I finished up all the remaining parts of the build, and I scrubbed through, making sure to clean up anything I missed along the way to the best of my ability. Oh. Man, this is such a surreal moment. This project was honestly so difficult for me. I think I'm finally gonna build up this little pond area and just reflect on my journey. So I got to work hand painting the pond and making it as beautiful as I possibly could. And I made a little gazebo where you can sit by the water and ruminate. It's always sad adding the water and partly covering up your beautiful art, but I cheered myself up by building an elegant custom tree. <sighs> There's so much more to do to make this build come alive with interiors and extra details, but I'm really proud of how far this project has come. And for for now, I'm ready to leave the end, and it's dumb inhabitants. So I built one last thing, a little tower to help blend the exit portal. Yep, this should do the trick. See you later, thanks for watching. Recently I did my first ever 100 days video with my friend Javi, Hi. and it was so cool to see how much you can get done in 100 Minecraft days. But it got me thinking, in most 100 days videos you start from scratch, but how much could I get done in the same amount of time on my well established 10 year old super flat survival world? That's what we're finding out today. Okay now, before I get started there's just one thing I need to make clear. I have no idea how many days old this world is. Back in 2012 when I made this world, statistics didn't even exist, and over the years mine have been corrupted or reset several times. It's just impossible to know, but don't take it from me, take it from this legendary YouTuber whose world is only a few months older than mine. When we started the world, st statistics didn't even exist, so they're not accurate anyway, uh, and they got corrupted once in the past too. Well putty though. So here we are, it's the night of day 2249, I'm gonna go to sleep and it'll be day 2250.
All right, let's get started. I kicked off day zero by heading to the nether to repair my tools at my piglin farm. With my tools ready to go, it was time to get to work on our first project, finishing off the Mason department store, or as I like to call it, Macy's. The focus of these 100 days is gonna be finishing off as much of the lower part of my city as possible. With some of the biggest goals for our world recently completed, it only makes sense to chip away at the biggest task of all, filling in our massive city. I spent most of the day struggling with armor stands to make this really cool display case, and as the night turned stormy, I finished off the lower level with this fancy ceiling fan. The next day, I moved on to the second floor. I made a staircase to get up to the attic and roof and then worked on some nice furniture to fill in the space a little. I made a nice big fireplace to tie into the chimney on the exterior of the building. And then I went to craft some campfires and cartography tables for decorating. On day two, I finished up the second floor with a fancy little couch and then decorated the attic and the roof a bit. Finishing up Macy's was a good warm up, but it was time to move on to some bigger projects. I spent the next morning gathering up my materials and then I set to work on a nice big bank. I spent the entirety of day four working on building up the bank. I worked a bit on the back entrance, which is on the second floor, and a vault area, which will be in the basement. After another full day of work, the front of the building was looking pretty much finished, and by the end of day six, the right side was just about done as well. I wrapped up the left and the back side of the building on day seven and grabbed some terracotta to use for a nice trim at the top of the building. With the back pretty much finished, I moved on to the roof on day eight, and by day nine, the roof was complete and I was back to working on the interior. On day 10, I made big progress on the interior. I used cartography tables for the counters, which which is a really cool trick. It only works in a few directions due to the texture, but I got lucky and none of the ugly sides were showing. I used loads and loads of trap doors on this, and I also crafted up a beacon to use as a light table for like checking counterfeit money. Then on day 11, I worked on creating the vault. I think it came out really cool. I'm thinking maybe at some point I'll store like my extra diamonds and gold here. The next day I built up the balcony on the second floor and I made a spiral staircase to get up. I also added a few more details to the bottom floor, which really helps it feel complete. On day 13, I went to grab some blackstone and then began the third floor. I got harassed for a while by this gold skeleton. I guess he thought the bank was open for business. He's clearly a high rolling gentleman. I kicked off day 14 by building a nice fancy chandelier and then I visited my bee farm to craft up loads of beehives. These things make great filing cabinets and I figure a bank would have a lot of records. I also ran out of flower pots and had to run back to my base to craft some more. By day 15, the third floor was just about finished. I got to see a bat get shot in the face by a skeleton, which made my day. And then I tried to make one of those book cart things you see in libraries, but I ended up just making some sort of reading motorcycle. I call it the bookmobile. Somehow a creeper found his way into it, so I guess he just lives there forever now. This guy is truly hooked on phonics. What should we name him? I used a ton of beehives again on day 16 while finishing up the attic of the building. I figured the attic would best serve as some sort of like archival record storage. By the morning of day 17, the bank was officially complete. I spent the day cleaning up my shulkers and gathering up materials for my next big project covering up our mushroom stem farm. I love building with mushroom stems, but getting them in bulk is such a pain that a while back, I decided to build this amazing automatic farm by Alex Bomberg. But it's been a real eyesore in my world, so I'm gonna hide it inside of a giant mushroom. I actually designed the mushroom in creative with my good friend Snippet a few months back on a live stream, so all I really have to do is copy over the design. As the sun rose on day 18, I headed over to the mob hotel to grab some bone blocks to give our mushroom stem a bit of texture. But after building up the stem for a while, I got nervous and I wanted to double check that the farm was still functioning. Luckily it was, so I got back to work after a bat took a bullet for a creeper. That bat should join the secret service. On day 19, I worked on cleaning up the interior of our shroom a bit. And then I visited our mob hotel once again, this time to visit our hanging root farm. The roots are a really nice touch. I concluded our second 10 days by expanding the staircase in front to give access to the area where the farm is restocked with mushrooms and bone meal. I also blended the terraforming a bit and hid some lighting around under moss carpets. We're already 20 days in, and we've actually accomplished a lot, so I thought I'd give you guys a closer look. Having the terracotta store all finished up is just really nice. I come here quite frequently and it just looks so much better than it did. And it makes the city so immersive when every single part of the building is filled up with detail. The bank was a really fun build and is such an awesome addition to the town. I think all the details behind these counters came out really, really cool. I'm a big fan of this vault and I really love the idea of coming up here and seeing all the bank records and files and this guy. We're making really good progress on this mushroom as well. And I'm hoping I can get it somewhere finished in about 10 days, so let's get working. On day 21, it was back to work on the mushroom stem. I added some little shelf mushrooms to the side like you see on trees sometimes, and they came out really cool. By the next day, I was ready to start the mushroom cap. For this, I'm gonna need a bunch of oxidized copper, so I went ahead and laid out a copper field so it can convert while I build. I got as far as I could on the mushroom cap on day 23, but I really wanna use diamond blocks as the little spots, and I don't really have a ton of diamonds. So it was time to go on a massive end rating adventure. See, 
see, the only way to get diamonds in super flat is to find them in loot chests, and end cities are really your best option. Luckily, I rarely need raw diamonds, since tools and armor are easily traded for. Essentially, raw diamonds are only used for enchanting tables, fancy fireworks, jukeboxes, and in our case, diamond blocks. And so days 24 through 28 were spent looting chests and slaying shulkers. Needless to say, I was very relieved to return home safely on the 29th day. By the end of it, I had 24 diamond blocks. Not bad for under two hours of work. I also had shulkers full of diamond loot. And I spent most of that day putting away the several shulkers full of goodies that I had acquired. While doing so, I cleaned up some chests that have been cluttering up my trading hall for forever. Doesn't it feel so good to get organized in this game? It's like that feeling you get when cleaning in real life, but even better because you don't have to move. I spent day 30 gathering up the oxidized copper and adding it to the mushroom cap. When it turned night, I was attacked by phantoms and I totally forgot that I've not been sleeping for the sake of the video. Oops. Luckily, this is the only time I slept during the 100 days. On day 31, I got some of the diamond blocks in place on top of our mushroom and man, do they look cool. I'd say it was worth it spending all that time in the end. All the diamonds seem to have attracted a visitor. It's always good to visit with my old friend. I got some ice from him, but unfortunately he didn't have any tropical fish or brown dye, both of which I've been needing. Maybe next time. I needed to wait for more copper to oxidize, so I said goodbye to Wandy T and then headed over to work closer to the copper field. I already had the foundation of a house started here, but I replaced the white terracotta with bricks and regular terracotta. Before the newest update, terracotta was so hard to get. I would have to rely on clay gifts from masons when I had the hero of the village status effect. But now that you can dry out mud into clay, it's so much easier to get in bulk. But I digress. On day 33, I finished up the roof of the building using the new mangrove wood. This truly is a 1.19 build. The next day I finished up with the interior and it came out really cozy. With the house finished, I went to check on my copper on day 35 and it looked like I would have enough to finish the cap. Sure enough, by day 36 the cap was complete, so I began to work on a little shed area to conceal the chests I used to stock the farm. I decided to add an outdoor porch area as well just to give the area some more interest. I spent the entirety of day 37 continuing to decorate, but at nighttime the mobs began getting in my way, so I made sure to light up the area a bit. Work on the porch area continued through day 38, and right before nighttime, I took a break to place soul lanterns on all the diamond spots on the mushroom cap. It gives the mushroom this cool glowing effect that I think looks super cool at night. I then spent the rest of the evening placing these little drippy nether brick things, which was inspired by one of my favorite mushrooms, the inky cap. These things look so magical. The next morning, I ran over to my super smelter to smelt some nether bricks in order to craft up some more nether brick fences. After finishing off the drippies, I went ahead and crafted up some sandstone, which we'll be using for the little ribs under the mushroom cap. Apparently they're called lamella? Lamella. Lamella. This was the only part of the build that I actually designed in world edit. Using the line command made it so easy to get the effect I was going for. It was a bit annoying to replicate in survival, but it looks so good. I topped off the sandstone by adding some oak wood and packed mud above, but before I could finish, I ran out of packed mud. So on days 40 and 41, I spent my time gathering up some more mud. I should mention, before making this video, I spent an entire afternoon rebuilding the blast chamber for this farm, which unfortunately exploded while I was working on our giant end base in the last video. Somehow my cat turned off the power strip for my PC and the footage for days 42 and 43 got corrupted. But basically, I spent day 42 running wood through the farm just to stress test it and make sure it wouldn't explode again. And then after placing the last of the packed mud, I spent day 43 getting all the final decorations in place for the porch area. I rebooted my PC and got back to work by spending day 44 baking some cakes and finishing up the little side building attached to the porch. The next day, I placed all the cakes around and put in a little more work on the interior of the mushroom stem. By day 46, the mushroom was officially done. At this point, I decided to give the farm another test, just to make sure I hadn't messed up any of the redstone while building everything. Luckily, the farm still ran like a dream. I can't tell you how happy I am to finally have this farm dressed up. It's gonna make using it so much nicer. I'm just very pleased with how it came out. I cleaned up all my shulker boxes on day 47, and I decided to spend the rest of the day making a few farms to dress up the path between the windmill and the mushroom. These were directly inspired by some Instagram posts I saw by Bure Builds or Bure Builds, not quite sure how to pronounce it, but they have some insane designs, including all of these incredibly detailed fossil tutorials up on their YouTube page. Go check them out, seriously. Anyways, the next day I took a short flight over my mountain range to grab some pods all, and then I finished up the farms and began improving the paths around the area. I spent the evening carving another path up to the windmill on the little hill behind our bee farm. Connecting everything up just makes the city feel so much more immersive. I spent day 49 adding a few more little mushrooms around our big one, and just doing some finishing touches on the whole area. And as we hit our 
halfway point on day 50, I decided it was time to start another big project. But before doing that, I just wanted to quickly build a little mud hut in the empty space next to our little mangrove roof building. I worked on it all day, and by day 51 it was finished, and I began gathering the materials for our next project. I laid the foundation for what will be a naval academy, where the sailors of this harbor earn their sea legs. The whole building is built on a diagonal, so it should be a fun challenge. On day 52, I built a little windsock, and then I started laying in the floors of the building. The next day I got started on the classroom area. I'm using lecterns for the desks, which I think looks pretty good. On day 54, I turned my attention to this cafeteria area, and I made a little janitor's closet in this awkward corner of the build. One thing I thought would be really cool is making some banners of the nautical alphabet. So I spent the entirety of day 55 designing the banners, and then day 56 naming them and making copies. Making loads of banners like this is so time consuming. But if the cyberpunk city taught me anything, it's how much of a difference they can make when it comes to immersion and detail. Finally, I was ready to place them around on day 57, and afterwards I worked on the roof, which is a mix of jungle, acacia, and granite. On day 58, I took a break to go trade with the cartographer villager for the globe banner pattern, which I've apparently never done. I used the pattern to make a cute little globe banner for the classroom. Afterwards, I got to work on the ceiling. I made some ceiling rafters with lots of buoys stored above like you might see in an old boathouse. On day 59, I added a between the tower part of the building and the lower part of the roof. I think when the build's done, I'm gonna hang some nautical banners here. I also built this little hanging boat in the classroom. At first, I wasn't sure how it looked, but holy moly, I'm in love with it. It makes the classroom feel so immersive. By day 60, the build was nearly done. I made a little area in the back of the build for boat storage, and then I decided to build a little tree next to it with jungle fences and leaves. These kind of trees are so easy to make and they come out so good, so while I had the materials in my hot bar, I decided to build a few more around town. And I also hit this this sick trick shot. Dude, perfect. The only part of the building left to do is the tower, so on day 61 I worked on building it up a bit and planning out where the staircase will go. I spent the entire next day working on the interior for the tower, where the sailors bunk together, and I turned the very top into sort of like a bell tower. By day 63 I was putting on the finishing touches. I added this little fire escape to the side of the tower, which really helps the front feel a bit less empty and awkward. Finally on day 64 I was ready to call the build finished, so I added the naval flags to the wire as promised. Can you tell what it says? With the Naval Academy finished, it was time to start a new project, so I packed up my shulker boxes and moved next door to make a flower shop. I chose a really fun color palette for this build, and I actually think it fits pretty well with the area. Also, I slayed a spider jockey the same moment that lightning struck, which just felt pretty metal, so I had to share it. The next day was another banner day. This time I spelled out flowers for the storefront. This didn't take nearly as long as the nautical banners, so afterwards I had time to put in the floors of the building. On day 66, I had a mossy roof to the building with loads of little tulips and then I worked on a little stall for out front. I love using campfires as like a trellis or a, or a pergola, an, an arbor. Someone explain the difference, please. A cool trick you can do is to put kelp on the campfires and they kind of look like fallen leaves. On day 67, I added a second floor to the building and then decorated as much as I could. I spent way too much time on day 68 adding these fancy signs above the counter, but I think it was worth all the copy and pasting weird symbols. This just looks so cute. I figured a flower shop would be selling some hose, so I wasted an entire netherite ingot just for the decoration. Was it worth it? Who knows? On funny number day, I crafted a respawn anchor to decorate the bedroom and I crafted this neat mirror banner to go above it. But the decoration still didn't feel expensive enough, so the next day I went to my sketchy obsidian box under bedrock where I kill withers now. I used to murder them using the end portal like a normal person, but now my end portal is decorated all nicely. After I got the nether star, I crafted a beacon to use as a little crystal ball at the end of the bed. I'm guessing the lady who runs this flower shop is into some witchy stuff, like I don't know, astrology and tarot cards. Too bad I can't get Amethyst cause she would definitely have some crystals. Anyhow, the flower shop was now pretty much finished so I went ahead and built up the path a little. I'm sure most of you guys know this trick but dried out brain coral can be great for a little variation. On day 71, I began yet another new building. One of my goals for this world is to have a building for each villager profession. So this is gonna be the building for the fishermen. I'm going for like an eclectic shack sort of look. I had to clean up this little area that I used to restock the bees in the bee farm whenever they mysteriously seriously disappear. Does this happen to anyone else? Like, they just disappear sometimes. I guess I'll have to make a new place for restocking bees at some point. I kicked off day 72 by working on a little market stall for selling fish. I also added like a crow's nest sort of tower that I planned to connect to the fishing shack with a rope bridge. I finished up the day with some little details around the base of the structure like a boulder and some scattered barrels. I spent most of day 73 working on blending paths around the area, and by the morning of day 74 it was looking so much better. I spent the rest of the day decorating even more. I added an 
anchor, a life preserver, some lobster traps, and a big swordfish. Before I knew it, we were already three quarters of the way through 100 days. I was very much feeling the urgency, but I pressed forward and traded with some villagers for cod to create a little pool of them. I also went through and made sure all of the item frames had items. On day 76, I began expanding the building upwards. I made some spots where the fishermen villagers will go eventually. I'm gonna worry about getting the villagers here some other time. That's probably a stream project. I also had to go craft some more campfires and smelt a bit more terracotta. By day 77, I was onto the third floor of the structure. I decided to use mangrove wood again for the roof, and once that was in place, I started getting in a lot of the final decorations. I was really proud of this telescope I made on day 78 by pushing a lightning rod into an armor stand. And I was also really proud of this weather vane design I made. I just love being creative in this game. I finished up the day by building the catwalk between the crow's nest and the shack. A catwalk to a crow's nest. Almost sounds like the start of a bad joke. So a cat and a crow walk into a bar. <laughs> With the building basically finished, I spent day 79 creating some miscellaneous banners to hang along the rope bridge. After that, I decided to do a few more custom trees to add some more greenery to the area. I started out with a pine tree, but while I was collecting some leaves to use, I accidentally broke my enchanted shears. So I visited my library and made a new pair. Does anyone else enchant their shears? Is it just me? It's just me, isn't it? The next day, I built a custom peach tree. Adding pink terracotta for the peaches is another idea I got from Bure Builds. Huge shout out to them. After finishing those trees, I decided to add a lot more decorations to my moss factory. So I got my shulkers ready, and the next morning, I began decorating and trying to make the entrance into the basement look a little bit better. I wanted to set up a minecart that goes back and forth to give the area a bit of life. So on day 82, I went ahead and built some scaffolding, and then I set up a loading dock where the minecart can deliver the moss. I decided to build a little shed to the bigger factory and also to fill in some of the empty space. So I worked on it all of day 83 until night fell and it began to thunder. I wanted to try to get a skeleton skull because I have a cool idea for some fish bones. After frantically running around all night catching charge creepers and boats, I had a setup for each type of mob head. But the skeleton didn't die and the normal creeper blew up the charge creeper. So the only one that really panned out was the zombie. One for three, not great. But I brushed off that frustrating experience and turned my attention back to the shed, finishing off the roof by the end of day 84. On day 85, I began putting in all the little finishing touches, cause the little details matter. With the shed pretty much finished, I just had to make the minecart go back and forth. I laid down the tracks and it looked cool and all, but I want the minecart to stop for a few seconds when it reaches the shed before it takes off again. But rather than dive into this daunting redstone task, I went back to my base to refill my fireworks shulker. But by the dawn of the next day, I could delay no more and I dove into making the worst redstone of my life. Like seriously, this is a monster. Monstrosity. I'm not even quite sure why or how it works, but somehow it did what I wanted. My brain was totally shot from that experience, so I decided to get back to building. It was time to fill in the last few red outlines that have been lingering in the city for almost two years now. This first building is gonna be like a warehouse with a big crane for grabbing cargo off ships. I quickly built up the walls and by day 87, I was putting in the roof. I've never really done a copper roof in the city, so I decided to try my hand at one of those nice copper gradients. The next day I worked on all the interior details and finally on day 89, I added in the crane on the roof. I spent another netherite ingot on the lodestone for the crane. I think this is the third lodestone I've made purely for decoration in this world. But what can I say? They just look so cool. I had a little time left in the day to begin the final building in this lower section of the city. Since it was nice and small, I was able to work super fast and by day 90, I was finishing up the interior. I wanted to use blackstone for the roof, but I couldn't find my blackstone shulker box anywhere. So I reviewed the footage and discovered that my blackstone shulker had avoided being picked up and it despawned forever. Not a big deal since I can just piglin barter for more blackstone, but I was kind of bummed out about losing all my gilded blackstone since it's great for decorating and kind of a pain to get, but that's a problem for future Mog. I headed to my piglin bartering farm to replace the old shulker, and then I visited my sea pickle farm since I had finally run out. I guess I use a lot of these when I decorate. The next day I gathered up a bit more mud since I was out of that as well, and with those materials I was able to finish the building up. With only 10 days left, it was time to get in as many finishing touches on this section of the city as possible. A few of the interiors really needed some work, so I headed to my base to grab some armor sets and got to decorating. But after staring at the purple roof building for a few minutes, I realized I hate the color palette and I decided to switch it up. Most of day 92 was spent swapping blocks out, but I was happy I did it because this new light gray terracotta and dripstone combo looks really 
unique and interesting. On day 93, I focused on the interior and I came up with this piano design I'm really proud of. So proud in fact that I tweeted about it, which is like the adult Minecrafter equivalent of bringing home a drawing to put on the fridge. I also moved next door to finish up the interior on the blue roof building. By day 94, that building was done too. And the next day I moved on to this tiny little greenhouse building. That didn't take long at all. And so I moved on to the final remaining interior, the second floor of this smokehouse building. I started by using the few leftover diamonds I had to make an enchantment table. This interior was a huge challenge due to the floor being half slabs, so I really had to get creative. As the sun rose on day 96, I went to go dye some leather armor. I've been having a lot of fun mixing the dye colors together to get some really weird hues. I always forget that this is a feature. I finished up the interior, meaning that the entire lower city was now pretty much complete. I spent the rest of the day making a candle banner, and then the next day I used it to make a little candle stand outside of Macy's. I also added a little booth selling the armor and tools from the next door Black Cat Blacksmith. Then I headed over to the crane building to add some bundles of wood that the crane would have grabbed off of ships. On day 98, I set up some cannons and TNT over by the inn. I built up a bunch of crates and barrels, but it was a bit slow since I was constantly being rushed by mobs. I really need to do a better job of lighting up this area. On day 99, I added sort of a boat launch loading system to the docks, and then suddenly it was day 100. That really snuck up on me. Not wanting to waste a single moment, I spent the full day building some extra booths along the docks, and I made a little staircase by our bank. But as the sun rose on day 101, I had to accept that the 100 days were over. A hundred days down, and I'm actually impressed with how much we got done. If I can fill in the whole city like this, this will really become my dream world. The world I've wanted since I was a kid. Totally immersive and full of life. I just hope I can get there someday. But if we keep going like this, I'm sure it won't take long. Thanks for watching. so frustrated. Minecraft 1.20 is introducing all these new plants and everyone is losing their minds over it. Everyone except me, that is. I love plants, but when it comes to Minecraft, I'm stuck here in my 10 year old super flat survival world with no fun plants in sight. I can't get bamboo, spore blossoms, cocoa beans, berry bushes, the list goes on and on. And now they're adding the torch flower to that list and possibly even more. I've had enough. It's time to take matters into my own hands. Today, I'm building the greenhouse to end all greenhouses and it's gonna be filled with every plant I've ever wanted. Then we're gonna have someone from my local botanical garden review the greenhouse and let me know how I did. But the only day they're available is in exactly one week, which means I only have seven days to build this entire thing. <laughs> yeah, we better get started. First, we need to find the perfect spot for this thing. I want the greenhouse to be huge, so I'm not sure anywhere in this main city is gonna work. I think a cool spot would be beyond the mountains over there by Salacia Beach, so the first thing we need to do is create a path going up the mountain. For that, we're gonna need some moss. This little factory should give us everything we need. Next up, we need to run our cobble generator. This thing is fully automatic, and it uses efficient blasts instead of TNT duping. Now, I do have to dupe sand from the wandering trader to make the TNT, but getting all that gunpowder and then crafting it is definitely still a challenge. Okay, now that we have all this cobble and moss, we can craft up some mossy cobblestone and stone bricks and start painting this path into place. I transitioned the rough dirt path up the mountain into a more built up stone walkway that naturally winds along the custom terraforming we've done rather than cutting right through it. I added this little covered part because I'm trying to think more about sight lines when I build and I want this to frame the bottom of our greenhouse. Lastly, I added a stone walkway leading to our build site. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. All right, next we need to make some sort of platform for the greenhouse to sit on. I wanna use diorite for this, but if you haven't noticed, this is a super flat world, so we're gonna need to craft it. We've got the cobblestone, so now we just need some quartz from the piglin bartering system. Okay, hopefully this is enough. While I work on placing this platform, let me go through the three main materials for this build palette. First up is green glass, which will help the greenhouse look extra green. Second is oxidized copper, and third is warped wood. All right, our platform's done, so let's start tackling those resources. The easiest one is glass. I have a cactus farm thanks to my friend Wandy T, so I can throw some of that in my super smelter and the dye shouldn't be an issue. But trading for the glass itself is gonna be a pain. I don't like to smelt my duped sand, so we're gonna need a lot of librarians. I've been working on giving each villager a special building in my world, like Macy's, which is the home of my mason villagers, or the Black Hat Blacksmith, where my weapon and toolsmiths live. But I've yet to build a library, so we're just gonna have to stash these guys somewhere for safekeeping. 
Welcome to your new home, boys. <laughs> it's so nice. Okay, I just spent half the day trading, so hopefully this is gonna be enough. Next up is the copper. I built ENX-04's copper farm design on one of my end islands, so we just need to AFK for a few minutes. My bad, a, a few hours. S sorry, a few days. Yeah, that took so long. I left my copper farm running almost around the clock, but it still took up two entire days to get it all. I literally even set alarms throughout the night so I could wake myself up and tend Bruh. to the farm. I'm just hoping we'll have enough to finish the project. Now we can leave this out to oxidize and move on to the last of the three materials we need. Warped wood. I still don't have any nether tree farms, and if we're gonna get enough warp wood to build this project, that needs to change like now. Since I need this fast, I modified ENX-04's versatile tree farm to get rid of the TNT duping and scaffold since, you know, we can't get bamboo. Kind of the whole reason we're doing all this. <sighs> so I quickly built up the tree farm and collected plenty of warped wood all while my copper was oxidizing in the meantime. It's actually really satisfying going around and collecting it all. Okay, so the good news is I think we have everything we need. The bad news is it's already I basically have 48 hours left to build this entire greenhouse and fill it with plants, or I let down a local plant expert and the thousands of people watching this video. No pressure, right? <laughs> and so, I finally started building. I'm gonna start with these lower greenhouses here and just sort of figure out how this style is gonna look. To kick things off, I built up the entrance, using copper as the base block, warped wood for the trimming and ornate details, and green glass windows as planned. Inside, I put some iron bars and chains to provide support for the structure. I'm using the fence gates on top to create those little parallel supports you see on greenhouse roofs. I think it's a really good effect. And there we go. Now I just need to build the end cap. Dude, this is looking so sick. You can already just start to see it from our main base. And this is exactly what I was talking about when I mentioned sight lines earlier. Now to copy this over to the other side. A couple years ago when I moved across the country, a bunch of my house plants couldn't fit in the car, and then even more died on the way because it was winter. But doing this build is really making me want to build up my house plant collection again. All right, that went much faster the second time around. I'm so happy with how this is looking, but I have to stay focused and keep going. These little guys were just the warm up. I have to build this whole big main greenhouse, starting with a domed entrance right at the top of the stairs. All right, so first we lay down this basic circle shape, but this is looking a bit plain, so now we're gonna throw down the detail and it's really gonna come to life. The entrance is like a double layer cake with a smaller dome stacked on top of a bigger one. The way the green glass filters green light into the interior is so beautiful. Once we get the plants in here, this place is really gonna be special. The view from our main base is looking so cool. I was kind of worried you weren't gonna be able to see it very well from here, so I'm really happy with this. That space underneath the greenhouse is driving me crazy, so I'm here at my dirt mines to get some packed mud. In creative mode, I put together a super simple wall segment, and then I used world edit to quickly copy paste the pattern. Then in survival mode, I'm able to use Lightmatica's easy place function to speed this whole process up significantly. Ah, oh, this looks so much better. But unfortunately, it's getting very late, and we seem to have bitten off more than we can chew. Maybe if I like pull an all nighter tomorrow, I can still make this work. <laughs> The weight of this situation is starting to sink in. The meeting is tomorrow morning, just over 24 hours from now, and we literally don't have a single plant here yet. So basically, my only choice is to play all day today and just see what I can get done. I found this list of Minecraft plants in the wiki, and there are a lot of them. So I think it'll make me feel better if we knock off a few. Azalea bushes look really nice in the garden, so that's one down at least. Man, what have I gotten myself into? I'm over at Macy's right now buying some terracotta to use in some little ponds. I think these will really enhance the nature -y feel of this build. I painted down a little swirl pattern that should add some nice color to the bottom of the ponds. After that, I filled them up with water and began adding some plants. I wanna do some cattails like this, but Wandy T hasn't sold me brown dye in forever. So instead I'm using pink, magenta, and purple candles to sort of be like water flowers. I don't know how realistic this is, but but it sure does look cool. I think we can knock off kelp, seagrass, lily pads, and drip leaf from the list. Now I wanna get all the crops done and I think I wanna put them in these lower two greenhouses. I really wanna try to enhance each type of crop somehow by putting some sort of big version of it. So I got real creative and started making some extra thick versions of the four main crops we know and love. And then with the extra space in the back, I made a pumpkin patch. In the other greenhouse, I kick things off by setting up an irrigation system for some sugar cane, which I enhance with some white candles on top. I also put a little barrel of sugar. I grouped up chorus fruit with the cactus in a little desert area, and I tried to knock out a few more crops as well. 
I'm pretty happy with how this looks so far. These XL potatoes are pretty goofy, but they're fun. I'm also really happy with this other greenhouse. There's some really fun details, like these little creeper heads as mini melons. And we've got some non-Minecraft crops like turnips, radishes, and cabbage. I feel like we just crossed off a ton of plants on the list, so I am feeling a bit better about that. But I've already been working for hours. So if I'm gonna finish the rest of the greenhouse, I'm gonna have to build faster than I ever have before. Let's just get on with this, shall we? tried my best, but that whole all-nighter idea, no, no, no. I'm not the young man I once was anymore. Honestly, I really have no idea what I'm gonna do, but that's a problem for tomorrow, Mog Swamp. Waking up Monday morning was hard, but when I rolled over to check my phone, my whole day changed. So I just got an email that says something came up and they can't do the interview until after spring break. That means I have another week to finish this project. Relief immediately washed over me and I realized how hard I've been pushing myself. I mean, the whole point of this project is to have a special place in my world to relax. Something had to change. We're here at Zilker Botanical Garden to get some inspiration from all these plants, but more importantly, just to relax a little. Look, 1.20. Something about the fresh air and being surrounded by plants was such a good reset for me. I really needed it. I really hope I can have a garden kind of like this someday, but until then, I'll have my Minecraft greenhouse. Speaking of which, I'm feeling very inspired to get back to work. I relaxed my pace a lot and focused on finishing up the greenhouse exterior over the next couple days, and I had a lot of fun with it. I dove down some crazy YouTube rabbit holes, and before I knew it, the outside was finished. This is looking awesome, but we've still got the entire interior to do, and a whole lot of plants to knock off the list. First, let's take care of the moss block and carpet. I want the floor to be a gradient of stone pathways that transition into moss where we're gonna put a lot of the plants. I just love how well this gradient works. There needs to be a way to get up to the second level and I noticed a lot of the greenhouses on Pinterest have these ornate white spiral staircases. So I did my best to create that look and I built it up on each side. And you can actually walk up them. All right, let's take care of even more plants. The list just says flowers, but I wanna make sure we get all of them. I'm gonna put a bunch in these gardens in front of the base with a focus on tulips. Nice, I think this pattern looks pretty good. All right, and for these ones by the staircase, I'm gonna do some enhanced tulips. <laughs> These are so cartoony, but I kind of love them. I mean, when you think about the size of the Minecraft bee, it kind of makes sense. Okay, now for the rest of the flowers. Poppies, enhance. Dandelions, enhance. Cornflower, enhance. Allium, blue orchid. Wither roses, lily of the valley. Azure, blue it. And oxide, daisy. But Mog Swamp, what about the two block tall flowers? Well, if you were paying attention in the intro, you'd know that these are unobtainable and super flat. Wandy T doesn't sell them and they don't grow in plains biomes. But that's not gonna stop me. We're gonna build our own bigger, better version, starting with the rose bush. All right, this is looking pretty cool. We've got the red glazed terracotta as the roses, the end rods as the thorns, and little candles as like little rose buds. Next up, I wanna take on the sunflowers. <laughs> these came out cool. I might even like these better than the real sunflowers in the game. Next up is lilac. And there we go. A little bit of allium and some purple slabs. And we've got this lovely vine going all the way to the tippy top up here. Last but not least is the peony. Had to go a bit abstract for these, but they kind of look like the real thing. But there's still some flowers left, although they're not really in the game yet. It's looking like I probably won't get the torch flower in super flat, so let's try to build that one. Even though it's a real flower, a lot of people have been complaining that the torch flower doesn't create smoke or any light, so I did my best to fix that. This actually came out really cool. It's like this epic jungle plant. If we ever do get torch flowers, we can always replace these ferns. And last but not least for the flowers, let's try to do those two leaked flowers from Roger Badgerman. One of them is like some blue berry 
berries on uh, mixed with vines. <laughs> this kind of works, I guess. And this other one is almost like a jungle log slab with a plant coming out of it. Huh? This is uh, as close as we're gonna get. I'm having so much fun trying to fake some of these unobtainable items, so let's just keep going. One of the ones that hurts the most is bamboo, but I think using glass panes, fences, and candles, we can kind of get there. I mean, you gotta use your imagination a little bit, but this actually came out better than I thought. Now for two more unobtainables. Here are our cocoa beans. Eh? Not bad. And the best I can think of for dead bush is using some mangrove roots over in our desert area. And now sweet berries and spore blossoms. For the sweet berries, I'm using spruce leaves and candles as the berries. And we're gonna use candles once again to be the petals falling from the spore blossom. This might be my favorite plant we've built yet. With pretty much all the unobtainables done, I knocked a few last things off the list, so basically all that's left are the different tree types. But the wiki- I don't want to talk about my levels. But the wiki also provided this list of plant-adjacent things, so I made these little pools to cross off the coral blocks, and I even added some fake sponge to the big pool in the main room. All of the fungi is going to go in this entrance dome, and I'm gonna put them all around the statue of a mushroom deity. And I saved this room in the back for a little spot dedicated to bees. But first I need to farm some bee nests. This actually takes forever ever to do. I do not recommend it. Ah, oh, but it was worth it. There we go. The bee nest to composter gradient works so well, but that's all you get to see for now. I've still got a lot of empty pots to fill in and the ceilings need more vines for sure. Not to mention the bees, trees, and shrooms, which are going to make this place come alive. So I'm saving the special reveal for our final tour. And it's done. I finished this up before bed last night. I'm so nervous to show you guys and to show our guest. Speaking of which, why don't we introduce him? How's it going? My name is Matthew Gass and I'm the director of education here at Zilker Botanical Garden. Thank you so much for joining us. You mentioned that you have a little bit of experience with Minecraft. Yeah, so I've built a couple Minecraft worlds and kind of glass houses, but probably not to the scale that you might have created. <laughs> All right, Matthew, welcome to my world. This is actually a super flat world. Do you happen to know what that is? I don't know what that is, no. Time for the big reveal. Here is my greenhouse. Wow, look at that. Looks like a giant Victorian greenhouse. Oh, I'm so happy you said that. Victorian is exactly the style I'm going for. We've got some tulips over here. The four colors of tulips it gives you are white, orange, red, and pink. The plant basically has the capacity to produce a variety of different colors because of the enzymes and molecular pathways. There are certain colors that occur more frequently. So they could have included yellow. I don't know why they didn't. One thing that might be a little bit realistic is this pumpkin. I mean, pumpkins can grow huge, right? Yes, pumpkins can get massive, you can strategically remove all of the developing roots so that you only have one, and then all the sugars from the leaf are gonna be going to that one pumpkin. Here we've got some sugar cane. I know that this game has bamboo and it has sugar cane. In my opinion, they should swap the blocks. Bamboo has an underground stem called a rhizome and it spreads and then it pops up all over the place. So right. bamboo would kind of look like this. Sugar cane would usually be a singular stem bunching from the base. This is sort of an imaginary plant in the game. This it's called a chorus fruit. My partner and I beat the ender dragon and then we felt successful and stopped there. But <laughs> I've, I've used this fruit before. When you eat it, you actually like teleport randomly. Are there any fruits uh, that do that in real life? <laughs> Maybe a hallucinogenic fruit. I mean, if you ate some kind of- <laughs> Yeah, I guess the, the cactus here, right? Uh, so up these stairs here in the first entrance dome, I've dedicated to be all about mushrooms and fungi. This definitely looks like a mushroom I've seen in real life. Probably think of the Amanita. They're called toadstools. The field of mycology is relatively new. There's still lots to be learned. One of the blocks in the game, I've done my best to fake it here. It's called mycelium. It's kind of like roots. It's the organism that's spreading out in a fibrous pattern, and then it produces like the mushroom. Mushroom. Their cells have multiple ways of communicating. They can move their nuclei around. Is lichen another mushroomy thing? It is not a plant. It is more of like an algae living with a fungus. <laughs> the Minecraft wiki had some plant adjacent things. One of the things it listed was kelp as its own separate thing. Kelp is defined as an algae, but if you ask someone in Victorian England if kelp was a plant, they would say yes. Same thing with mushrooms. In this game, oak trees actually drop apples but I'm assuming in real life, you'd have to have an apple tree for that. Yeah, oaks drop acorns, so. Moving along, we've got some custom birch trees. I tend to see these skinnier birch trees in real life. Birch trees aren't super long lived, so they don't get super thick. So all the small ones, 
are pretty accurate. These are alliums. Alliums. You probably ate one in the past a week. Onions. Really? You notice the flower is just kind of like nothing is there except the little stem. That's because everything is under the soil. So these are onions and garlic and shallots. The only thing about your design is that the leaves look like grass. On your big ones, it looks like you have- Oh, kind of so this is not accurate. We got to get rid of this. Now it's accurate. <laughs> there, there we go. go. They added this azalea bush and then you can grow these. So is azalea classified as a bush or a tree? I would say it's more of a bush. There is not a very distinct definition of what a tree is. These in the game are called dark oak trees. When I was Googling, I was seeing some trees with these golden leaves. Think of something in Bavaria, like a dark oak forest. I think they're just going for, oh, there's a lot of oaks out there. This one has darker wood. This is a mangrove tree, a relatively Ooh. recent addition to the game. They have these propagules that fall right off the leaves into the mud down here and become wow. new mangrove trees. Yes, I didn't know they had this one in the game. That's amazing. The seeds basically germinate on the tree and that's called vivipary. It's like a baby kangaroo of, huh? of plants, of the plant <laughs> world. I reconstructed a couple of these oh. stone lanterns that I was seeing all around Zilker. Yeah, at Zilker Botanical Garden, we have 12 different toro. There's kind of like five different elements. Earth in the bottom, water, and then you have the firebox, which is fire, and then you have air and then spirit on top. You've made a really nice one here. Over here, we've got Ooh. ourselves a nice big Mario style piranha plant. So this type of plant has a bear trap. They don't get super big. And then you have the victory bell and the penthes. Those cups can get huge. This isn't really plants, but we've got a whole bee room. So at Zilker Botanical Garden, we do uh, provide habitat for the bees. We have a lot of native bees that are called sweat bees. You have an area that is kind of unmaintained. That is great habitat. Right here, we've got our jungle trees. I've built some trees that aren't actually in the game. Um, some big palm trees here. This is my best try at an acacia. In all the reference images, they seem to have branches that sort of all meet at like one flat top. Acacia, like the one you've described, has a spreading form to create like a canopy. There's even research showing that people enjoy the look of spreading trees. It's like shelter, it's shade. Mm, are there any other examples? Baobab is a monkey pot tree. There's Italian stone pine, literally a pine tree, but it grows up and spreads. These are my spruce trees back here. And then there's these sweet berries. Do you have any idea what they're trying to emulate with those sweet berries? I've thought about this because when I play Minecraft, sweet berries are my favorite. I think of kind of the Ikea berries they put with your Oh, meatball. the lingon berries, yeah. yeah. This is an upcoming tree. These are cherry blossom trees. I don't even know if they're referring to one specific type of tree. Cherries, apricots, and peaches are all in the same genus. We can't grow cherry trees, but we want to, so we grow peaches. That's a prunus persica. That's a peach tree, but it doesn't really produce fruits. Texas version of a cherry blossom. These are called wither roses. I've done my best to create a giant version of it. What I mainly took inspiration from, I believe it's called a corpse flower. Yeah. So that's called the Raphelsia. It is pollinated by things that like rotting things. Flies? Flies and maybe beetles. That would basically be our whole tour of this Victorian glass house. Well done. It looks fantastic. Botanical gardens are a great place for education, research, and just enjoying the natural world around you. And if you're in the Austin area, come to Zilker Botanical Garden. That's where I am. So yeah, you can donate. That would help us tremendously. So we can educate more folks and, and keep our garden flourishing. Or you can also donate and support your local botanical garden in your area if you would like to. Thanks again for being here and have a great rest of your day, Matthew. All right, thanks for having me. It's been a while since I put out a video and it's because recently I went through a move and although it's a major life upgrade for me, it's still very difficult and stressful to pack away your entire life and start over somewhere new. But for almost 11 years, this Minecraft world has been a constant in my life. Life can be chaotic and unpredictable, but this world is always here for me. And here in this garden, I can find peace and comfort whenever life gets stressful in the future. And if life ever gets stressful for you too, I hope you join me here for a deep breath. Thanks for watching. Today, I'm gonna spend a hundred full Minecraft days building a city. You see, it's already been almost three years since I made a master plan for my super flat survival world. At the time, many of my projects sat unfinished and sort of disconnected from one another, but I had a vision for a grand city surrounded by a massive mountain range, unifying everything in the world. And although I'm definitely proud of all the progress we've made, let's be honest, there's still not much of a city. So today I'm tackling this entire northeast quadrant of the map. We are gonna build as much as possible, starting now. 
I kicked off day one by beginning construction on a curved road that's gonna connect the top tier of the city to the lower platform. I've designed everything ahead of time in a creative copy of my world, and I'm using a mod called Lightmatica to help me see where everything needs to go. Notice how I'm leaving plenty of space for the houses to go, because I want this road to contain fancy housing for all the people of the city who work at the nearby lumber mill. This brings me to the first great challenge of this project, building diagonally. You see this? This is a building, and over here is another building. They nice and straight, just like in Minecraft. Easy enough, right? But take a look from above and everything changes. Even cities with grids have all sorts of slants. It's what gives a city life. But building diagonally in Minecraft has always been a struggle for me. Like, how do you make a door? <laughs> so as I built the road up over the next few days, I prepared to face my fears head on and build as many diagonal structures as possible. All right, so I think I broke my lumber mill again, which is also my mud and cobble farm. But at least this time, nothing seems to have blown up. I think just the piston conveyors got messed up, so I'm just gonna have to fix this later. Luckily, I had enough mud to finish the walls for our road, and after chopping a bit of acacia wood, the job was finished. I quickly laid out the path for the lower road, which doubles back to reach an even lower tier of the city containing the lonely lumber mill. Don't worry, buddy. Soon you'll have lots of other building friends. On day seven, I set out to give our lumber mill some buddies by starting on the first house. This one isn't actually diagonal, so consider it a bit of a warm up. The further down this road we build, the more slanted the houses are gonna get. I built the house very directly based on the historic 1889 C.A. Belden House in San Francisco, a prime example of one of my favorite architectural styles, Queen and Victorians. We'll talk about them a bit more later in the video. By the end of day eight, I made some great progress and the house basically just needed a roof, which I worked on the next day. I began another one on day 10 and after a long, hard Minecraft day of work, the house was just about finished. On day 11, I wrapped things up by adding a little tower on top, and then I powered through the next house. And by this point, things were starting to get pretty slanted. I actually didn't even use reference photos for these last two houses, so I could focus more on the diagonal construction. My strategy was to take the normal rectangle of a Minecraft building and start dividing it up into odd sections, sliding things over one block at a time. This split and slide method is something I've used before in my city, like on these shops over at the harbor. It also kind of sounds like the name of a new line dance. To the left. I went to craft some more looms on day 12, and I was able to finish up the third house, and then I began constructing a fourth house using that same split and slide technique to create the diagonal. For this one, I took inspiration for the color palette from this house on Carl Street, which is also in San Francisco. Nothing could stop the building train. And I finished the building by the end of day 13 and began house number five the next day. This was the first truly diagonal house, so rather than using the split and slide method, I instead had to establish a diagonal line that felt natural, which was a significant challenge. For houses like this, I would fly way up in the sky, look at the center of my base, and try to imagine that the house was like a little slice of the pizza. That probably made no sense, but pizza is cool. After establishing the general shape, I based the form of the building on yet another house from San Francisco, this time from the iconic Alamo Square. This one was built in 1894. Only 90s kids will remember, am I right? The next day I cleaned out my inventory, and I cleaned up a few missing details, and then I started on house number six at nightfall. For this one, I paid homage to the historic 1891 Corbin Norton House on Martha's Vineyard, an island belonging to my home state of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, the gorgeous color palette called for a bunch of mangrove wood, which is my least favorite wood type to collect, but collect I did, and by the end of day 16, I was finished with that house and on to the next. This was the last house with any sort of back to it, by the way. I made a little porch area, which again is straight from the reference. Lecterns are fantastic for railings like this. At this point, I guess I fancied myself as a bit of an architect, because I decided to go off reference for this little pink house on day 17. I found that using fences and walls around the windows not only helps mitigate the difficult diagonal building, but it also creates the heavily ornamental look that you see with these Queen Anne's. I ran out of gilded netherrack, and I also needed more quartz, so now would be a good time to dive a little deeper into the architecture. So as I mentioned, this style of house is called a Queen Anne Victorian, which is a bit of a confusing name. See, architects have this annoying habit of naming some of their styles after whoever ruled Britain at the time. That's why you may have heard of the Georgian style, named after King George, or Edwardian after King Edward, or Jacobian after... James? Huh. Apparently James in Latin is Jacobus? Just when I thought this couldn't get any more confusing. Anyhow, so right away the name Queen Anne Victorian is confusing. Like, which queen is it? Anne or Victoria? Well, really, Victoria is more accurate. The Victorian era lasted from 1837 to 1901, and most Queen Anne Victorians were built between 1880 and 1901, which, by the way, is precisely the time period I like to build from in my world. In the UK, there's an entirely different architectural style called Queen Anne that looks nothing at all like the US version. So 
what happened here? Long story short, some silly Americans built some ornate Victorian houses and didn't know much about architecture, so they called yes. them Queen Anne's, even though they shared almost nothing in common no. with their namesake. They tend to be very ornate, often with big front porches, steeply pitched roofs, and an emphasis on asymmetry. In the 1960s, there was a movement to paint these old Victorians with two to three bright colors in order to accentuate their intricate architectural details. These became known as painted ladies, but they have nothing to do with these butterflies, which are also called painted ladies. There's a famous row of them in San Francisco lining Alamo Square called Postcard Row. Oh, and apparently one of these is the house from Full House? I don't know, man. My head hurts, and I think we've done enough learning for today. Luckily, I got what I needed from the nether, and I was able to start some new buildings by the end of day 18. These two buildings are built at a true 45 degree diagonal line, making them a bit easier than some of the other ones. The pair is based very closely on the historic 1890 Albert Wilford houses, once again in San Francisco. This time we're in the Pacific Heights neighborhood. According to the National Register of Historic Places in San Francisco, these houses are quite unique for their use of an equilateral arched domical bay roof. I think that's these things? I opted to skip out on building the equilateral arch domical bay roofs, but I think the buildings came out pretty good regardless. I finished up on day 19, and on our 20th day, I began house number 10. That's two days per building, not bad at all. For the reference on this next house, we go back again to Massachusetts, this time in Hyde Park, which is a neighborhood of Boston. The unique coloring inspired me to do this blue terracotta trim with the light blue concrete powder, but then for the roof, I decided to go off reference in order to get just a bit more contrast with the other houses when you look at it from above. Too much blackstone can be really overbearing, and I unfortunately can't get deep slate in my super flat world to break it up. I finished the building up on day 21, and I began gathering materials for the last two buildings on the road. This pair's inspiration are two iconic painted ladies at Alamo Square. According to Zillow, this pink one was built for the Harder family in 1899. The renovated home sold for 7.3 million in 2021. The green one appears to have been sold in 2022 for a much more affordable 4.6 million. Suddenly, Wandy T's prices seem reasonable. But luckily, I can build these Minecraft versions for free. Well, I guess that's not quite true, because I ran out of glass and I had to go do a bit of trading. But once I had secured enough glass to finish the project, I was able to spend all of day 23 working on the buildings. The detailing on these was really a delight, even though the diagonal was a bit wonky. The birch and the sandstone work beautifully together against these slightly desaturated terracotta colors, and it just really sells that Queen Anne style. I wrapped up the buildings on day 24, and before I knew it, I was a quarter of the way through the 100 days. Wandy T stopped by to congratulate me on my progress, but he had nothing good for sale. Bruh. Before we go any further into the video, I just have to ask, are you my science teacher? If so, then please click away to another video. Now that he's gone, I can tell you guys, I have an amazing plushie for sale right now on Makeshift, and it may or may not be based on my high school science teacher. Is that legal? I... There's only two weeks left to place your order, and I'll probably never do this again. This is basically the cutest way to pledge your allegiance to Superflap forever. Or, you know, sell it in 10 years for 5 million Dogecoins and buy a new Android girlfriend. This thing is so high quality, and he's so cute. I went back and forth so many times with the designers to make sure it was perfect. Look, he's holding my logo, and he even has my Minecon cape. We need 200 orders to make sure these get made, so go to the description, click the link, and order one right now. All right, back to the video. I was needing a break from constructing houses, so I decided to switch things up by heading down to the water to work on some docks. I stopped to collect some mangrove wood on day 26, and then I spent the evening working on the docks and battling mobs. Smaller cargo ships can go into the city harbor, but the narrow passage and shallow water significantly limits the size of the vessels. The Wanderer is about as big as you can fit, so bigger ships will be able to use these docks to drop off some of the larger goods like raw lumber. I will say, this more industrial, cluttered style of building is very new to me. But people are always asking me how to get better at building, and I think the answer is really the same as with anything else. Go outside your comfort zone. If you only practice what you're already good at, then it's not really practicing now, is it? As the sun went down on day 28, it just really struck me how much progress we've made as I flew towards our city. This could be the most significant transformation my world has ever seen in a single episode. After working on the docks straight through to day 29, I was really running out of spruce wood. And with my lumber mill temporarily out of commission until I had time to sit down and repair it, I was gonna have to collect all all my spruce wood manually. All the trapdoors for the docks ate right through all the wood I had left, and I had no choice but to take a break and chop down some tall spruce trees on day 30. After a bit more work on the docks, I spent the next day refueling. I crafted more rockets, I grabbed some golden carrots, and I moved some of my shulker boxes to a more convenient location. After that, I started a custom oak tree that's gonna act as a buffer between the first house in this row and the hairpin turn in the road. The next morning, I was finally ready to get started on another house. 
The inspiration for this one takes us to Ocean Grove, New Jersey. This storybook-like seven-bedroom fantasy masterpiece includes a lush garden out front, which is part of what inspired me to create the custom oak tree. I was also inspired by the patterns in the shingles to do these little mangrove slab patterns on the blackstone roof. The reference also inspired me to do this little quartz lined window protruding from the tower roof. I really enjoyed this one and it felt like I was really hitting my stride because at this point I barely noticed I was building slanted at all. On day 34 I wrapped up my 13th house and began construction on a new one. Unfortunately I couldn't find any information on the reference for this next house, but it sure looks nice. I strayed away from the reference a little bit by adding this rooftop porch in order to deal with a tough roof line. Roofs are probably the most difficult part of building on a slant, but they can also be kind of forgiving. Like a lot of the more awkward spots kind of just get filtered out by your imagination, especially at a distance. I broke ground on the 15th house as the sun rose on day 36. The amazing color palette for this one comes straight from this historic 1892 Seattle mansion known as the Madrona Castle. It was built during this population boom that followed the Great Seattle Fire of 1889. These light brown shingles you see in some of the photos of the house inspired me to use spruce wood for the roof, and I think that was the perfect choice. On day 36, the house was finished and I was feeling amazing about how the road was looking. These big path block squares are actually the slime chunks in my city. The path blocks disable them from spawning and then when I go to build in the area, I can kind of blend the ground enough that they don't stand out too much. There's a few examples of this throughout the city already. Wandy T stopped by again on day 38 and I bought some tropical fish from him and then got back to work on the paths. The next day I was ready to go back to building so I began working on the biggest houses yet. I'm imagining that most of the people in the houses we've been building are either office workers for the lumber mill or the docks, or they work on the upper level of the city where I'll be putting government buildings like a post office, a town hall, and a library. The houses closest to the mill probably belong to its wealthy owners, which is why we're going a bit bigger and more extravagant. The one I'm building now is inspired by the Albert H. Beach House, built in 1896, not even 10 years after the town of Escondido that it sits in was incorporated. So basically my Minecraft world is older than the town was when they built the house. Bruh. This house in particular really made me wish we had a green wood type. Please Mojang, it would be so awesome, please. Instead I was forced to use the warped wood, which strays quite a bit from the reference, but I think it works okay nonetheless. After a couple trips to the nether for warped wood and blackstone, the building was finished by day 43. I'm using white terracotta for this next one, but unfortunately I don't have any in stock at Macy's, the home of my Mason villagers. I'm only able to buy 48 blocks per day, so it might take a little while to finish. Even though I'm using white terracotta, my main inspiration is called the pink lady, otherwise known as the J. Milton Carson house. This lovely house was built in 1889 in Eureka, California, just across the street from the Carson Mansion, which is perhaps the most famous Queen Anne Victorian, other than maybe the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. William Carson, the rich guy who lived in the Carson Mansion, had the pink lady constructed for his son as a wedding present. I don't think I even brought a present to the last wedding I went to. Now I feel terrible. Maybe when one not 20 rolls around, I'll add some cherry wood to the house and make it a little bit more pink. But with the pink blocks in the game at the moment, I just couldn't really find a good option. These bigger houses are really fun to do, especially after doing all the skinny row houses. I feel like I have space to spread out and really explore this Victorian style. Between gathering the granite, the quartz, and the terracotta, progress on this house was relatively slow and the days were just flying by. So on day 48, I began construction on the final Queen Anne house. We can work on this while I wait for the materials I need to finish our pink lady replica. I'll be doing plenty more buildings, but most of them from here on out will be shops and offices. For this last one, I wanted to try more more of a classic brick construction rather than the vibrant painted lady style. Coincidentally, two different buildings from the same town came up in my online research. Details on these houses were pretty scarce online. I'm not sure if they might have had the same architect or if there's any relation between them at all. But I found it quite fun to work with the enormous diagonal porch and I'm pretty happy with how the building came out. Afterwards, I finished up that little gazebo and I made several passes on all the houses, adding any remaining missing blocks I could find. I continued tidying up for the next few days and I tried lighting up a bit as well. I also want to add vegetation where possible, so I worked on a big custom spruce tree. Also, mobs were starting to get pretty frustrating, so I pretended to promise myself to get better at lighting things up. Once again, I relocated my shulker boxes on day 54, and the next day I was done cleaning things up and ready to continue building. I gave myself a break from all the diagonal building with this quirky little drugstore. This is the kind of place that would have a big counter inside with a soda fountain and sell things like candy, cigars, and lipstick. I can't wait to do the interior for this in the future. I have so many ideas. These little banners take forever to do, but they really complete the old time.
old-timey look. With the banners done, I was ready to move on to another building. I knew I wanted one on this corner, but I wasn't sure what to build at first. But I figured since the cemetery is just down the stairs, it would make sense to build some sort of morgue or mortuary. I tried to make it look rather official, so it stood out as sort of a scholarly structure. The interior for this one is also going to be super fun. The next day, I added a few more custom trees around the area, and then I started working on an office building for the lumber mill on day 59. It took me all of day 60 and the morning of day 61 to finish it off. And despite my best efforts, I still had a lot of lighting up to do. On day 62, I built a little oak tree behind the new office, and then I began a new building in the center of the lumber yard. I'm imagining this one to be sort of like a combination warehouse and office. I'm adding a bit more texture variation to these work buildings, since they're going to have a little bit more wear and tear, and they're just not going to be as well kept as the houses. After finishing the green building, I started working on a big flag to fly over the mortuary. It's an enlarged version of this banner I came up with to represent the city. The design kind of matches the carpet in the tower, but it also represents this obelisk I'm planning on building in the temple. On day 64, I started building an extra big version of the flags on the east and the west sides of the temple. I tried to texture them as much as possible to make them look like worn fabric and avoid them becoming too cartoonish looking. After I finished the flags, I spent the rest of day 65 beginning another road for the city. This one will connect up to what's currently this dead end and provide a way to get down from the top level. On day 66, I stopped to cook some more stone bricks and then I began working on the walls of the road. For the gradient, I've chosen, I'm gonna need to trade for a bunch of cyan terracotta, and I'll also need to chop some acacia wood. The next day, I decided to do another house, probably for the family that runs the drugstore. I'm trying to do more of a simplistic floor plan that still fits in with the other dwellings in the area in terms of color palette. I needed some more warped wood, so I headed to the nether and then finished up the house on day 68. After finishing up the house, it was back to work on the road, and this work continued throughout the next three days. I chose to leave the inside edge of the road unfinished for now. I'd like to eventually build a big opera house that's gonna take up most of the available space on this level, but nope. that's gonna have to wait for a future episode. With the road done, I decided to try something very new on day 72. I added some blackstone birds above the city. I'm so in love with how these birds came out. I really hope you guys like them too. Next up, I started building a circular section of dock, which I worked on for all of day 73. I wanna add a lot more structures to the dock, so I started working on a new one up top to help ease the transition into the dock area. I also started the foundations of some buildings down on the docks themselves. Over the next several days, I jumped from building to building, slowly collecting any missing resources and building everything up. I had to take tons of little breaks to collect various materials, but by day 78, I had wrapped up most of the buildings in progress and I could focus on combing through for any missing details like barrels or pipes. I'm hoping once I do all the interiors, this entire region is just gonna be so full of life. Next, I turn my attention to the lumber yard. I wanna add a lot more machinery and infrastructure to make this place feel more like a bustling work yard. I added this big gear thing and it's starting to add that industrial feel to this area. Another thing I always mention when people ask me how to get better at building is that you need to collaborate. I totally hit a mental block when it came to this steampunk industrial style, so I hit up my good friend Shovel241. Just hopping on a call with him and building for a bit was enough to give me the confidence to complete this area. That's not how I remember it, Mog. I built all this for you. Cut, cut the tape. Huge shout out to Shovel, go subscribe to him. I spent day 83 working on a loading dock to finish off the back of the lumber mill, which has sat unfinished in my world for far too long now. I gotta finish this little uh, face of the building and then I also need to do the back here. The back is a sight for sore eyes. Um, that's not how you use that expression, is it? Well, you know what I mean. The next day I created this basin to help transport logs and other cargo either into the mill or towards the storehouse. And the day after that I filled the basin with water and created some more infrastructure around it. I'm so happy with how it looks so far. I even made this little telegraph wire between the main dock office and the lumber mill. Now they can send cheeky little messages to each other like SpongeBob and Patrick with the bubbles. On day 86 I did some work on that dock office building, but it requires me to trade for cyan terracotta, so progress on this building is gonna be very gradual. I also built the elevator platform itself out of a bunch of campfires, and then I spent the next day working more on the loading dock area. Once again, as I was flying back towards the city, the magnitude of everything we've built so far really just hit me. You could honestly title any of my videos Adult Man Made Weirdly Emotional by His Own Minecraft Builds, and that would be pretty accurate. But when you've spent as long as I have in the same world, it somehow feels reasonable. I buckled down on finishing up all the infrastructure around the lumber mill, and by the end of day 90, I was pretty happy to call it somewhat finished. With only 10 days left to go, I decided 
decided to focus on making the docks feel more full. I started this red building that's sort of half on the docks, half on the city platform. On day 93, I built some more small trees and I addressed some of the unfinished dock supports. Who couldn't use a little more support, you know? <laughs> the next day I started this little house on the spiral road with basement access to the docks. And the next day after that, I built another small house next to it. After everything I've learned from designing the complicated diagonal Queen Anne's, these smaller dwellings feel like a total breeze and they get us a lot closer to that cluttered look we're going for. I was able to finish the buildings and go back to adding little details to the dock, like this new stand. The next day I kept adding details and I realized I really need to finish that dock office, so I traded for as much cyan terracotta as I could and chipped away at it. Afterwards, I started making a little black market area on the docks. I kept working as hard as I could, wrapping up all the dock supports on day 98 and trying to finish off any missing detail I could find. Identifying and adding in all the missing details can be quite time consuming, and before I knew it, I was on day 100. I went ahead and I built this little spot for a hanging billboard. Maybe you guys can help me decide what goes there. I also started one last building on the docks, but as the sun went down, I just had to accept that 100 days was now over, but I just couldn't help myself. So I spent another two and a half hours working as hard as I could to finish the dock area to the best of my ability. I went totally crazy with the details and it was definitely worth it. If you guys like this type of video, I'll do 100 days of interiors and I'll make an interior for every single one of the houses. And maybe I'll even do some interior work at my nether hub and my end base. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more. So that's it, another full year in my super flat world. It feels fitting that the 10th year was the most insane one yet, but we're far from finished with this world. So I hope you'll join me for another year of hard work. And next year, we can look back again at everything we've accomplished. What do you want to accomplish over the next year? Let me know down in the comments and we can both check back on how we did. See you in 2024.